Oh, should be interesting with hard hitting takes like 49ers best kept secret, the greatest hair in the NFL. I'm clicking on that story 1,000 out of 1,000 times. Peter Hartlab speaks directly to me and to people who enjoy the finer things in life. Peter, how are you, my friend? I am doing great, and I think that's a fantastic story idea, Dale. That will be out on Friday. Um, <laughs> yeah, and Ike, like, good-looking bald man. I also like how Ike um, is, like, I, I go to spring training and I see an Ike's there. I see an Ike's everywhere. He's still kind of like a small businessman. He still has those vibes. So i um, glad to see you and Ike hooked up like that. And uh, glad to see you thriving, man. I've been enjoying this for the last few months. Um, I see you more than ever. You're coming across my timeline constantly and uh, love clicking in and love that you invited me on your show. Well, thank you. It was an easy invitation to give because you and I just bumped into each other and I'm actually wearing a remnant I picked up that day. You and I bumped into each other at the A's Fan Fest, which was such a great day a couple of weeks ago. And we know that they're planning, you know, a an in-parking lot tailgate where they don't even go into the game. And it feels like the team is trying to subvert that by restricting hours of access to the parking lot, which used to not happen. But there is like this jaded, constant attack of their fans. You will not have fun on our property. You will not be welcome if you're an A's fan to an A's game. And these fans, whether they're screaming into the void or not, I, I don't even know. But I love what they're doing. I love what they're trying to do. And Peter, most of all, I love that they're savvy enough to have every single person who works on the Coliseum on their side. And they are now tapping into the media to, I think, facilitate action and response better than ever before. These fans are smart and they're learning. Yeah. And you know what? I, I feel like the more they get restricted, the bigger they get. I mean, when are the teams going to learn, you know, whether it's with the A's or with Rennell, the more you try to shut down those gates like people don't have Bart, like they're not going to get there early. And I'm a I'm a Giants fan. I saw you at that event. I went there because I was so angry about what someone was doing to a team in the Bay Area. Um, I, I feel like every move has been a bad one and they're not learning from it. And maybe they don't want to learn. Maybe they get some kind of it's like a fetish. I don't know. They get some kind of joy out of it. But it, it shocks me. I'm going to go out on on this week. I'm going to go out there with my son. We're going to take Bart over. Shut the gates. I don't care. I'll drive over to the Fruitvale Station. It's one stop over. People in Bay Area can figure this stuff out. It's it's uh, the first time I think we've ever seen like this intentional of a self-sabotage from an owner to destroy his own product to the point where it's turning people off. He can write that story about how no one comes to our games anymore. Well, that was by your own design that that happened. Yeah. Uh, people have <clears throat> loved to have bagged on the Coliseum. We never hated the Coliseum. So that really wasn't the problem. It certainly has gone under a, a level of decay that even no one could have expected. I mean, there's freaking possums in the press box, for God's sakes. But um, it, it's it's terrible what has happened to the Bay Area. It's terrible what has happened to Oakland with the Raiders and now the A's. And like I said, going to Vegas, bringing us back to the opening segment of Pandora's Box. Who would have ever thought that the strangest bedfellow sports would ever see the city of Las Vegas become a destination for not just one, but two Bay Area teams? I, I think what's amazing, and we're in the Chronicle Archive, and this is the history of the Bay Area in back of me. I could go over to the Franklin Maiuli file, owner of the Warriors, pull it out, and show you numerous photos of him partying with the fans. We have a photo of Franklin Muley sitting on a cooler, drinking a Coors in the Coliseum Arena parking lot there. Could you imagine that happening with John Fisher? Do you think John Fisher's ever had a meaningful conversation with the fans who fill that ballpark and forget that, Peter? I don't even think he has a cooler. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, I hope we can retain the name. I mean, that's the biggest thing I'm rooting for. I hope we can retain the team, but I hope we can retain the name because. They get the profits, the owners get the profits, but the fans get to tell the story. And that's what's happening with the A's right now. The fans get to tell the story. 
MLB may not want that story out. John Fisher may not want that story out, but that story is going to get out because we're in an age where we're empowered. We can go on social media. We can have a voice. As a journalist, I'm not on a pedestal anymore. I have to have interactions with people. And John Fisher does too, and MLB does too, and they're going to hear it. And I think this year is going to be glorious. I mean, the, these last dive bar and, you know, Oakland 68s, I mean, everything that they're doing is, it feels like I'm in a movie. It feels cinematic. Um, you made an incredible speech up there a couple weeks ago, and that was a bigger crowd than I've seen at an A's game in years. Um, so I, I, I'm looking forward to this year, but I'm just thoroughly frustrated by what's going on. I think the frustration is well, well felt and placed. And, uh, you know, I, I'm a baseball fan like you. I'm like baseball can literally pin me down, slap me about my face, steal my money, kick me in the nuts and walk away. And I'll be like, I love you. <laughs> you know, I mean, I just I I love baseball. I don't even know why anymore, because it doesn't fit into my life, my lifestyle, my two kids running around. I don't have four hours to dedicate to anything these days but NFL games because it moves the needle so much. And I am addicted. Um, but it, it does feel like you and I are becoming harder to find. Maybe that's our similar age that we share. Um, I have never in the 20 years that I've been out here covering sports, Peter, and you've lived here your entire life, have you ever felt a more dead on arrival baseball season? And this is even with the excitement that a Blake Snell signing kind of infused into an otherwise ho-hum off season for most Giants fans. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, I mean, what's happening with the A's is a different level, but with the Giants, um, you know, it's been a frustrating couple of years. Farhan Zaidi, you know, I expected more. Um, I expected more continuity. It just feels like they're throwing darts. Some of those darts are coming back with Blake Snell and Matt Chapman, but um, I'll, I'll be there on opening day. I'm there every opening day, but I'm there because it's beautiful out and it's a beautiful park. And uh, even that level, I mean, the park experience, I'm frustrated about that now too. So yeah, I agree. I, I, I can't think of a baseball season that I've been looking forward to less, maybe, maybe two months in, you know, that'll change right. a 12 game winning streak changes everything peter yeah <laughs> yeah and those those world series championships by the giants i was going into those seasons with a lot of um uh, pessimism too so right. you know, maybe something magical will happen that's why we do this but i agree with you i can't think of a baseball season in the bay area that had a bigger cloud over it uh, are you are you still a a giants season ticket holder i know that you are looking to no longer be a 49ers season ticket holder after yeah. you've been in your family for nearly three quarters of a century. I'm moving the money around, Damon. I mean, you know, those 49er tickets got more and more expensive. Um, my grandparents immigrated from Mexico in the 20s and their first luxury, this is family lore, the first luxury that they had was 49ers season tickets at Kizar Stadium. Nice. What and were their names? I, Tell me your grandparents' names. Uh, Luisa and Ramon. But, um, but they were sitting there and my family was sitting there and they'd travel for games. They'd go to the Rams games. Um, that was part of our family history. And really, I think, you know, two things. My grandfather was a boilermaker. He joined the union and they got 49ers tickets. And I think those things made them feel like Americans. It made them yeah. feel like they were belong and a part of it and, and joining this community. And generations later, we're more prosperous than they were, all of their descendants, but we can't afford the seats anymore. Um, they're, we've had the seats since Levi's opened and they're really expensive for me. I love going with my son. He has a great time, so I pay for it. But now they're upgrading our section to a luxury section. They're doubling the prices of the tickets. So my money's going to, I've been going to a lot more, uh, college basketball, USF and St. Mary's is a great deal. I go to giants and warriors games once in a while, and I just got Bay FC season tickets. Um, I will be a women's soccer fan down in San Jose this year. You just tweeted this morning uh, a picture of a this very funky soccer jersey, this kit. Yeah. With the, 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 the parrots of Telegraph Hill all over it. What, what, that, that looks awesome. That's SF City FC. And okay. That is a, um, they're like a, I don't know what you even call it. It's a USL two league it's a low low level minor league but they play at keysar stadium so you're sitting on the keysar stadium seats that you know every 
God, you know, all of our descendants sat in and watched the Niners and all the big high school uh, games on Thanksgiving. And so you get to watch that. You got Sutra Tower in the distance. And now they're wearing these incredible uniforms. They had a goalkeeper uniform a couple of years ago that was like Mork from Orc with the red and black striped yeah. shirt. The triangle and the Nanu Nanu. The goalie was wearing that and tickets are like, I don't know, they're like 10 or 15 bucks. It's a great deal. Everybody, halftime, just like they probably did at Kizar, walks out, goes to the corner store, loads up on beer, comes back. Uh, it's a great vibe. I'm going to go to pro sports too, but I'm putting more and more of my energy into following a high school team, following college teams, different stuff like that. Well, I'll tell you, I think that a lot of people are going to be following that that thought pattern because so many folks get priced out of major league baseball, NBA games. Chase center is an exorbitant cost point, no matter what you're going to in there. Um, Levi stadium, like you said, it's nothing is getting less expensive. Um, it feels like sports for all my life have been the last bastion of a community being able to get together. And it's less like that now because again, it's a, it's a tax bracket that is allowed to go to professional sports where amateur sports, and we know, or, or, or let's just say less than the big professional sports, not amateur sports, but um, the Bay Area has always decidedly been a pro town. I feel a little shift there because, like you said, I can't afford a $65,000 commitment to the 49ers for one seat in a stadium. But what I can do is take my kids to this game and, and pick up a six pack and a bag of chips and some lawn chairs. And this is now the new sort of sports community gathering point. And the only folks that aren't here are the bunch of rich, sweet owners that you really wouldn't want here anyways. Yeah. My dad was a school teacher. My mom went back to school. We were really broke. I don't remember money ever stopping me from going to a Niner game, certainly not a Warriors or a Giants game. And now, I mean, you know, I'm thinking about it constantly. I mean, that's a Christmas present going to a Warriors game. We go to one Warriors game a year as a family and it's a Christmas present. You know, right. it's like it's like the big gift in the stocking is a Warriors game. And it didn't used to be that way. And I'll tell you, I, I notice it with the Niners. You know, you, they're still filling that stadium. They've got a good team. Honestly, the vibe's pretty good. But you notice it more and more that you don't recognize the people there, that they're coming out a little bit later each time after halftime, after getting their drinks in the club section. The club section keeps getting bigger. They're turning my section into more of a luxury club area and they're offering us seats somewhere else. But we don't want to move, you know, so I, I don't think they're treating those core fans, the fans that just absolutely made the 200 section of Oracle rock. The fans that at Candlestick Park, you know, it, it was like 300, you know, there may be 8,000 people there, but it sounded like 30,000. And that's the way the A's have been too. Those people are getting priced out. And when those people get priced out, I think they're going to notice it. I think, you know, they're not going to notice my family's gone. They're going to replace me with someone that'll pay the money. But I think they're going to notice that the people aren't as dedicated, aren't cheering as loud. And that middle class at those pro games, we're going to see it. We're going to notice it. I think you're right. I really do. Um, one of the things that you and I have always, I think, seen eye to eye on is romance in, let's call it, classic journalism. Uh, you are a journalist. You are talking to us right now from the archive room at the Chronicle, which is very, very cool, by the way. I got to You got to let me in there with yeah, you. I got, the, I got the Bobby around. Knight file right here. A ah. lot of photos of him stomping on chairs, uh, throwing chairs, a lot of photos of him yelling at players. I think that's Isaiah Thomas. That's Isaiah, that's Isaiah catching an earful, I think. Yeah. Uh, a lot, a lot of victories. You, you love some of these. There's a lot of good moments here. I'm sure you lived through, but, uh, so Bobby Knight, a lot of found, suits. Bobby a lot Knight of great found, suits. Nice. Those, oh, those jackets, they're not making those anymore. So Bobby Knight found Dean Garrett, who was the center on the 87 national championship team at city college. Bob yeah. Knight used to pluck talent out of San Francisco 
And he would come and eat meals in North Beach and would go to Original Joe's. And and there's a lot of Bobby Knight history in this town. So I'm guessing you got all kinds of stuff in there. Um, How often do you find yourself just lost in nostalgia? I mean, that's basically your column. That's what you do. You get lost in nostalgia. Yeah, no, I mean, I got a story out today where I found I didn't know this. How do we not know this? That in 1992, the Chronicle sent a reporter undercover at George Washington High School for a month. It's the plot of Never Been Kissed and it happened. And it's just like in back of me here. Uh, I found William Shatner riding on a killer whale at Marine World Africa, USA. People listening are going to remember Marine World, RIP. Were they promoting uh, found, uh, Star Trek Four at that time? Didn't Star Trek Four have yes, whales involved? Star Trek Four. He was <laughs> riding the high of Star Trek Four, and here's the amazing part: he's riding a killer whale, and it was for an environmental animal defense fund. That would <laughs> never happen today. I was digging through prom photos once, where I'm just like, oh, I'm going to do a, some kind of crappy slideshow where I'm showing all the different prom photos and fashions through the years, and I'm flipping through. And the Chronicle, unbeknownst to me, had sent a photographer to my prom and took a photo of the girl that dumped me with her new boyfriend that's staring back at me down here 30 years later. Fantastic. So, um, and is- all the sports you can imagine. You gave me, a, you, you were mentioning a few of your favorite players offline to me and and uh, Dale Davis. Like now I want to go find all our Dale Davis photos because, you know, his son's Sun's sun's here. So a lot of Indiana Bay Area connections and they're back here behind me. You got to come. I love it. I do. I would love to just dive into the file that says Grateful Dead or Fillmore on it. Holy shit. What that that must just be a bounty of fun. I got right here. uh, Bob Weir. That's Bob Weir of the Grateful Dead handcuffed being arrested on a marijuana bust in 1967. Nice. It looks like the, that looks like the Victorian right on uh, Ash, uh, Ashbury. It's their Ashbury Victorian. The cops tipped off the Chronicle and we went down there and uh, took photos of them getting busted. And I heard Jerry Garcia was across the street looking through a window, watching it happen. (laughs) History in the Chronicle. I love it. I absolutely love it. Uh, Again, you and I, we share the same kind of journalistic soul. I used to love the ink that would be on my fingers after I read a sports page. I used to I used to have a romance for newspapers. I was a paper boy. And obviously, I had a romance for radio. It's where I came into the city of San Francisco, and it's where I spent nearly 20 years. Uh, you know, had I, had I not been laid off, April 1st would have been my 10-year anniversary on 95.7 The Game. But obviously, radio, like newspapers, is losing that lifeblood of advertising to the internet and We're just watching it all kind of decay, and everyone's trying to do more with less, with fewer qualified people to do it. Um, Journalists that evolve live. Those who don't die. But it feels like even if you're trying to evolve, you, you know, the hammer of new media could still come down on you. What is it like working at the Chronicle now as opposed to 15 years ago? And by the way, 15 years ago, everyone was saying, like, this is bad. This is bad. This is bad. What is it like now? Because I talk to a lot of friends at radio stations, Peter, and they just say that this is, I mean, everyone is miserable. Everyone in the hallway just looks at the tips of their shoes as they're walking down it. There's, like, no fun in the hallway anymore. How's that? How's it for you? It's... It's been a wild ride. I mean, the big difference is I came in as a print journalist. I, there were broadcast classes. I didn't take them. And then got a couple of years into my career here, early 2000s, I realized I should have taken those. Um, My jobs evolved into, and I don't have to tell you this because you're the master at it. I'm a journalist slash ringmaster slash concierge. And every single one is equal. I'm a ringmaster. I've got to bring in a lot of voices. I see all the comments coming up here and I'm reading them. I mean, that kind of multitasking is what's required of our jobs now because it's not us on a pedestal shouting down to people and that's our jobs. It's us being a facilitator so that other voices can get in and be heard and be part of the conversation. And that's good. What people figured out is that I'm not that good at my job. They have really good takes too, and I've got to incorporate that in. Concierge, so much of my job now is taking requests. I put it, you know, in my tweets. I put it, X's, sorry, I don't know what they're called now. I put it in my stories. 
So much of it is, do you have a request? Dale Davis, I'm not kidding. You will probably see a story about Dale Davis in the next few weeks because you made that request. So it's totally changed. Everything's changed. And we're both writing it. And, you know, credit to us both that we're still in the business and finding different areas where the skating, where the puck's going, because the people who stuck with the old ways are all gone now. I mean, you just have to adapt. If we had a Chronicle Hall of Fame, who are your, who, who's your, your, your inaugural class? Well, Herb Kane, um, way high on that. I mean, we've got you know, literal busts of him. We put his typewriter under glass. Nobody else has their typewriter under what glass. What was his secret? Like, wh what made Herb Kane Herb Kane to the point where he basically was San Francisco's Truman Capote? He understood what we just talked about, which is he was a ringmaster and a concierge. He brought everybody in. And I'm still trying to do that now. Find the best way to let other people's voices in get off your own pedestal and be a facilitator for your community. And he was a master at that 50 years, 80 years before anybody had a name for it. He was engaging. He was a master of engagement. Um, and then he was a great writer too. I mean, his batting average, I pull a random Herb Cain column and it's incredible. Um, I, I love all of the sporting green people. I mean, even like an Ira Miller, just a kick-ass beat writer of the Niners, uh, Fred Larson, photographer of the Niners, people like that who just went and did the job. I miss the old style of beat writing. I miss waking up and reading that story and just pouring over those pages and pages of statistics. Um, that's a happy place. You know, I feel bad that my kids don't know. Yeah sports sections and back of cereal boxes don't <laughs> hold nearly the attention like they did when when we were uh, a little bit younger than we are now. Peter, I think you are someone who absolutely always has his pulse on the city, what people are interested in. I think you do it with uh, a sparkle in your eye and you, you know, in a world of people don't seem to get it anymore, you get it. You get it, brother. You you really do. And that's why I've always enjoyed your column. I don't know if I'm subscribing to the Chronicle, but for you to read your stuff, honestly, because uh, I get my sports news from other places. Uh, mostly I'm, I'm coming up with my own thoughts. I, I, I go out of my way to avoid people's columns. So I'm, I'm not plucking from them at times. You know, I want my opinion to be my opinion, not influenced by anybody else. But when I see you are behind something, I click on it every single time, man. You're great at what you do, and you certainly don't get into journalism these days for compliments, and there aren't many going around. Yeah. So allow me to end this by giving you a compliment. I think you one day will find yourself in the Herb Kane San Francisco Chronicle Hall of Fame, and, and it'll be deserved. Well, I appreciate that. And right, right back at you, you do the hardest thing, which is, and you did it for years at nights, and I listened to it, which was doing it by yourself and engaging in a way that was natural. And that's, I think that's the hardest gig is not having someone to bounce it off of, not having that dynamic and doing it in such an earnest way, bringing people in to this day. And back then when something bad happens, when there's bad news and I'm angry and I wanna process it, I wanna turn you on and listen to it. And I'm <laughs> glad that it's easier to do that now. It's easier than it ever was. The other thing is, and I saw it at that A's event. You just went up there. I don't think you knew you were going to go up there. I had no idea they were going to ask me to speak. And you were incredible. And it was from the heart. And it was earnest. And I think that's the other thing. I think it was easier to fake it when you had a column or you had a radio show and nobody was coming back at you unless they got past the gatekeeper or whatever. I think now in that ringmaster concierge age, if you're not earnest, if it's not coming for your heart, people are going to see through it. And that that event was from your heart spontaneous and it was great well there was nothing but heart at that event 
and it was awesome to see you there. Thanks for flagging me down. And again, you had your hat on, you had your sunglasses. I didn't recognize you at first. I even thought, I'm like, is this, I, who is this? What, 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 what's going right. on here? Uh, but it was great to see you. I'm so glad that we connected. And man, I, uh, I, I hope we do this again sometime. Please let me know about the stuff that you're working on. I always find yeah. it fascinating. You're always barking up my tree, man. All right. And we'll get you here in the archive. You're going to love oh, it. Oh, I'd love There's to. so much to see. I'd yeah. love to. That feels like a YouTube video unto itself. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Great talking to you. Great talking to Peter Hartlab of the San Francisco Chronicle. Just a super guy and a guy who gets it. And he's so right. You know, journalism used to be, hi, I'm a journalist with a capital J, and I'm smarter than you, I'm a better writer than you, and I'm going to talk at you, not with you. And modern journalism is the total opposite of that. It's not only engaging but getting information and processing information, like Peter said, taking requests. I mean, look at what we do in the chat. Look at how much we've gotten to know each other over here. These people who, you know, you were avatars and names to me about a year ago. A year into this, we're all friends now. <laughs>